Hi everyone, my name is David Chester and today I'm going to be presenting on physically realistic minimal models from E8. And this is a repeat talk that I gave recently at a conference discussing Octonians, the standard model and unification hosted by Tejinder Singh. In this conference, we're interested in the Octonian standard model and unification so that forces us to ask these questions. What are the Octonians? And specifically, we'll be focusing on how the Octonians relate to E8. And we'll talk about the standard model and what unification is. And we'll start with unification. Um, typically, you can write down an action in terms of the standard model and gravity with general relativity, but we wouldn't call this a unified field theory because uh, it doesn't really unify the coupling constants of nature and it doesn't solve any of the issues with quantum gravity. So Einstein's teleparallelism was an attempt at unification, and there's some deep history there that I won't go into, but in the modern perspective, typically by unification, we refer to uh, trying to unify the interactions into a single fundamental interaction, which often might unify the coupling constants of nature. And so that will motivate studies of grand unified theories or guts, and those don't include in gravity, but in this talk, we'll also be trying to understand how to combine gravity with grand unified theories. And along the way, we might also be curious to see if the fermionic sector, in addition to the bosonic force carriers, uh, would have some natural origin story. So the idea for this talk is that a single representation of the E8 Lie algebra can be used to describe all of the fields inside the standard model, as well as a gravitational sector. So we want to start by asking, well, what is E8? It, and E8 refers to many different but related objects. For instance, there's the E8 Lie group, which is this 248 dimensional manifold. There's the, the E8 Lie algebra, which uh, is related to the Lie group and has 248 generators. And then there's also the E8 root system that has uh, 240 root vectors that can be embedded in 8D. Also, there's things like the E8 Carton matrix, Dinkin diagram, E8 lattice, and obviously all those things are related in different ways, but it's just important to understand the differences between these objects when we're talking about E8. So, how do the Octonians relate to E8? Well, there's actually at least two ways that the, the Octonians really relate to E8. One way might be uh, the fact that the root system for E8 is in eight dimensions, so that motivates the study of Octonianic root systems for eight dimensional coordinates. But there's another way to relate the Octonians to E8, which is to study um, this octo-octonianic Jordan algebra that is basically that it's not a Jordan algebra, it's a tensor product of the Octonians with the exceptional Jordan algebra, and then considering all nested um, multiplications of this complicated object. And so this will relate to the E8 Lie algebra. And it's also worth noting that the E8 Lie algebra can be realized in many different ways. We can define it from the, the root system itself. We can implement it with these octo-octonians, as I was describing. We could also find it inside of CL16 to connect with Clifford algebras, or we could also see how E8 is embedded in the, the Lie algebra SO248. So it's really exciting time in physics because there's been a recent progress by Wilson Dre Minogue for the first time to actually understand how to use these, the tensor product of the Octonians with the exceptional Jordan algebra. This, uh, we weren't able to understand, physicists didn't, mathematicians didn't know how to work with this in the 1970s and really relate it to E8 in a full way. But there's been a lot of recent progress uh, just last year by Wilson Dre Minogue. So, uh, this new mathematics opens up a lot of potential for new physics. And to, to elaborate on this octo-octonionic relationship between uh, the octonians and E8, there's various different constructions of the E8 Lie algebra. One of those constructions uh, comes from Rosenfeld, where originally he had this idea of thinking of this octo-octonionic projective plane as a type of generalized projective geometry. And it was, it was claimed that the, the E8 was found as the isometry group of this uh, projective plane. Now, the, the, it wasn't rigorously published at first, so there was some debate on whether this generalized plane exists. But soon after, Freudenthal and Titz came up with an explicit construction of E8 that used the Octonians and the exceptional Jordan algebra. And since then, there's been other constructions as well, such as the, the barton sudsbury uh, construction, which focuses on the triality of E8 and SO8 and SO8, leading to SO16. And uh, Kugo and Townsend have discussed this as well. And also, of course, the, the recent construction from Wilson, Dre, and Minogue, which is pretty similar to the Freudenthal-Titz construction in a few ways. 
So I'll just briefly review some of the aspects of the, the Freudenthal tits construction. And the basic idea is, first of all, they use these things called derivation algebras. And when we study derivation algebras over octonians, we get we make contact with a lot of different exceptional Lie groups. So the smallest exceptional Lie group is G2. And that's the, the G2 algebra is the derivation algebra of the octonians. And then the second smallest exceptional Lie algebra is the F4 Lie algebra, which is the derivation algebra of the exceptional, uh, the exceptional Jordan algebra called J3O. And so Freudenthal and Titz found that you can actually construct Lie algebras by combining an alternative algebra, which we'll call A, and, and combining it with some Jordan algebra, J and B. And specifically, when we choose N equals three, and we choose A as octonians and B as octonians, we'll get the octonians and the exceptional Jordan algebra, and that will give us E8. And it turns out that if we fix one of the octonians and we switch it out with other division algebras, that allows us to make contact with other exceptional Lie groups such as F4, E6, E7, and finally E8. So there's also this interesting thing called the freudenthal tits magic square, which relates to the octonian, which describes this relationship that I mentioned between the octonians and the exceptional Lie groups. And since we're interested in the octonians at this, at this conference, we'll just ignore all of this stuff in the middle and just focus on the octonionic rows and columns. And you see that those isolate the exceptional Lie groups besides G2, because that one's much simpler. And so this really does motivate the tensor product of the octonians with the exceptional Jordan algebra for the study of E8. But it took a lot of time to actually understand how to make this work. And so it's just worth pointing out that in this uh, projective geometry that Rosenfeld was generalizing, he understood that we could get these uh, generalized projective planes that took the division algebras and tensored them with the octonians. And what's interesting about that is um, basically the, the curious fact here is that only the exceptional Lie groups contain spinner representations in the adjoint representation of the Lie, the Lie algebra. So F4 contains the 16 spinner in, inside the adjoint representation. E6 has this 32 spinner, E7 64, and finally E8 has this 128 spinner. So we're really going to be trying to pay attention to this 128 spinner inside of E8 and see how we can get this to be used for physics. And I should also just mention that um, my collaborators and I have done some work on the mathematical aspects of these division algebras and their relationship to the freudenthal tits construction and a few other things in collaboration with Daniele Cordetti, Alessio Morani, and Ray Ashheim, as well as Clee Irwin. So I'll just leave those references there for you to consider. And Another interesting thing that we actually looked at that I'll just briefly mention is that uh, there, um, Dixon actually introduced this uh, algebra that was a tensor product of the real complex quaternionic and octonians. And this has been popularized by Cole Fury recently. But these, these only considered the, those algebras itself, not matrix algebras or projective geometry. So what we were able to do is to consider projective planes and projective lines over this Dixon algebra to get what we're calling Dixon-Rosenfeld projective lines. And when we were able to do that, we were actually able to upload, up, uplift the physics of Cole Fury into these projective lines. And the motivation here is that once we go to the projective planes, it might allow us to provide three generations uh, for the, the physics that Cole Fury is working for, at least one proposal to do that. And it's really interesting because now this allows us to more easily compare the similarities and differences between Cole Fury's work and E8 itself. Because we know that we have this C cross H cross O algebra that Cole Fury uses, and we're interested in E8. Now, it's actually a fact that if you take the, the tensor product of the complex numbers and the octonians, it actually includes the split octonians. And these split octonians are associated with this uh, non-compact real form of E8. So we can combine octonians with octonians, or we can combine split octonians with octonians, and the split octonians are found in C cross O. And of course, C cross O also has C cross H. So if we consider C cross O cross J3O, we see that this C cross O is actually an alternative algebra. And this hadn't been pointed out in the literature either. So in some sense, the most exceptional freudenthal tits construction, in some sense, mathematically unifies E8 with um, what Cole Fury is doing. And we can see how we can get uh, C cross O to lead to split octonians, but then C cross O to also lead to, to C cross H. And of course, J3O has plenty of octonians in it as well. So 
I just also wanted to briefly review this uh, Wilson Dre Minogue construction for E8 because it's really exciting. And so to provide some historical context, it was understood that the exceptional Lie algebras should relate to octonionic matrices, but um, the precise structure of this was never figured out. And Faisa Gursi was really a pioneer for understanding how the octonians relate to G2, F4, and even E6. But at that time, no one was really able to figure out the true meaning of how to apply it to E8 directly. And basically all the researchers in the 1970s days gave up. And so this line of research, besides honestly some of the work of uh, Dre and Minogue, this line of research was sort of abandoned for a while, but recently there's new mathematics, which hopefully provides a new era for, era for octonionic physics. So Faisa Gersay was an exceptional physicist, and he was an advisor to many important physicists who did made great contributions to the octonians. And actually, there was a paper from 1973 by Gunari and Gersay where they looked at the quark structure in octonians and, and tried to relate it to QCD. And it's, it's a little puzzling because there's actually a mathematical error in this paper, and they, they kind of tried to skirt around it. But basically, they, they're interested in studying SU3, which is found inside of G2, which is the automorphism group of the octonians. But they didn't want to just describe quarks. They wanted to describe the quarks and leptons in the standard model, which forced them to go kind of outside um, the minimal representation of SU3, which is just with the three representation, because they needed multiple quarks. And so they tried using the octonians to make this work, but they couldn't get it to work, and they were able to get the split octonians to work. So their whole mathematics was based on the split octonians, but the, the point is that the automorphism group of the split octonians is a non-compact real form, uh, G2, uh, it's a non-compact real form of G2, and that one doesn't contain SU3. So it, it's curious how um, basically a lot of people, since they were really the experts in the octonionic mathematics, uh, a lot of people haven't really noticed this. And actually, Cole Fury did understand how to correct this uh, to some degree with, with her view on physics. And it, it helps to actually go to C cross O if you want to make that connection. But still, there's a lot of interesting rich physics. Um, and um, Gersay was also um, an advisor for Bars and Gunaiden. And they were actually, uh, they, they introduced a lot of crucial mathematics and physics for E8. One of the other amazing remarks that Gersi pointed out is that if you look at the EN root system, there's a lot of low dimensional isomorphisms and they often relate to physics. So if you look at E3, it's actually the same thing as A1 plus A2 as root systems. And that would correspond to SU3 cross SU2. And this is almost the standard model gauge group. It's just missing a U1 gauge group, but there's no root system for U1. So uh, basically, A A2 plus A1 from a root system perspective is the closest we could imagine getting to the standard model, and this is what E3 gives us. And it also turns out that E4 is isomorphic to A4, which corresponds to SU5, which is one of the most popular grand unified theory gauge groups that get used, gets used. And also there's E5, which is the same as D5, and this, is, this corresponds to spin 10. And spin 10 is remarkable because you can unify a single generation of fermions of the standard model into a single 16 representation. So in some sense, spin 10 gut unifies the fermions and also unifies the bosons, and that's very nice. And then, of course, E6 is its own exceptional Lie group, and E6 gut has also been introduced. E7 corresponds to E7, and finally, uh, E8 corresponds to E8. And the thing that's interesting is over time, everyone was obsessed with just studying these grand unified theories. So they would take a uh, Lie group, and they would just say, what happens if I make this a grand unified theory? But once we get to E6 gut, I mean, even that, uh, the, the model I'm going to be presenting has a different spectrum than E6 gut. But it's just curious to note that E7 itself actually contains E6 with the fermionic spectrum of E6 gut. So this actually provides a hint that if you even wanted to do E6 gut, you might start to realize that E7, you might not want to gauge E7, but rather consider it for an entire spectrum to get one generation. And also E8 then has three generations uh, in some sense it appears, but figuring out how to do this rigorously has been a challenge. Another point of confusion in the literature over the years has been this notion of compact versus non-compact, which relates to the notion of octonians versus split octonians, because the octonians um, give uh, rotations in eight dimensions of space, while the split octonians give rotations in four space and four time dimensions. And as I was mentioning, Gunai and Gerse uh, mentioned how they could use the split octonians, but then they implied it would relate to SU3, but uh, 
There's uh, actually work by de Graff and Marani who showed that only SU21 or SL3R can be found from inside the, the automorphism group of the split octonians. And it's also just worth pointing out because there's been some recent uh, work in the literature that has claimed that maybe SL3R could be used for a type of uh, QCD or something, but I, I just wanted to point out that um, Gelman and Neyman definitely did consider SL3R, so um, the, the, the pioneers of QC def QCD definitely understood the difference between compact and non-compact gauge groups. Um, but, and there's even some work in the literature discussing the, the role of SL3R for hadrons, so it's just worth pointing that out. And so my perspective is more that we want to use the octonians for QCD, but the split octonians are actually useful for three generations of matter. And so when we look inside this non-compact real form of E8, it actually contains the split octonians in one sector and the octonians in another sector, which we can use for three generations in QCD, essentially. And so what's really curious about this is that this, this identification of spin 4, 4 is the conformal group in 3 plus 3 dimensions. So we'll have 3 space and 3 time dimensions. And this seems really exotic at first. But as it turns out, these extra time dimensions are just going to be degrees of freedom that allow us to get spinner representations for an efficient code encoding of three generations. And so typically, we consider the Lorentz group spin 3, 1 as SL2C. And we'll take the conformal group as a spin 4, 2 for that. And that's also isomorphic to SU22. And one curious way to think about generalizing this, um, this is actually a conjecture of mine that spin 4, 4 would relate to SU22 over the split quaternions. But you can also just use uh, the split octonians itself to get the action of spin 4, 4. And that, that's well understood in the literature. So certainly there's some way to use uh, split division algebras to, to make contact with spin 4, 4. And then it's curious that it's also known that SL2 over the split quaternions relates to spin 3, 3. So it does make sense to consider uh, generalizing these complex numbers to split quaternionic numbers, but we could also just use the split octonians as well. And so what I'm talking about here, about three generations coming from the split octonians, there's actually work in the literature where Bertram Constant discussed how if you take sp8r, which might be motivated from considering relativistic phase space, if you look at the intersection of this with spin 4, 4, it gives three natural conformal charts, uh, which is suggestive for understanding how to get three generations of matter. And it's also worth pointing out that spin 4, 4 has a notion of triality. And I just figured I would mention that uh, Cole Fury and Mia Hughes have discussed triality in relation to the Higgs boson. And it seems like uh, the triality that we're interesting in is, is sort of a generalization of what they studied uh, to make contact with three generations. And we know the Higgs gives mass. And so basically this talk, we're going to consider more the intersection between spin 4, 4 and SU32. Because we're not going to really be interested in SP8R, but we're going to be interested in finding a gauge theory. And we're going to be interested in considering, can we gauge SU32 as it will be found inside of E8? So before diving into what we'll be talking about, it's worth briefly reviewing what the standard model is, right? So the, it's a chiral gauge theory, which means that we have left chiral fermions, but it uses this gauge group. So we have SU3 for the color force, SU2, and that leads to these W bosons. And then we have this uh, weak hypercharge U1, which isn't the electric U1, but it gives this other B boson that it's often called. And this uh, electroweak sim um, sector can be spontaneously broken to, to the electric U1. And this will help us identify glu gluons, W bosons, uh, and Z bosons, the W bosons and Z bones bosons acquire mass, and yet we get a massless photon, and the gluons are massless as well. And so this is the low energy physics that we found from the, the broken standard model, which has been more or less confirmed experimentally at the LHC. And it uses this uh, SU2 doublet complex Higgs field to break the symmetry. And as I was mentioning, all of the fermions are going to be left chiral where actually we're going to choose uh, charge conjugates of the right chiral fermions just as a convention that it makes it convenient for grand unified theories. So basically, um, the standard model uses uh, these compact, compact gauge groups. And it's really important if we want to get the electric charge that they have to all come from this SU2 cross U1 gauge group, just because there's been a other few models recently that have claimed to be the standard model. But technically, the standard model has SU3 gauge symmetry and acquires the electric charge from this uh, sector. So from my perspective, any model that does anything differently uh, 
uh, it might be a, a valid model to consider, but it, it's a little different than the standard model. So to review the fermionic sector of the standard model, I'll, I'll display a correspondence between the, the fields and how they enter the Lagrangian, which enters the action, and how they correspond to the representations. So um, there's this rich connection between representation theory and Lie groups. And essentially, we get these quark doublets. So we're going to get a quark, which has three different colors. And that's why we find a three representation of SU3. And we're going to get an up and down quark in this weak isospin doublet. And so that doublet is why there's a two here. So when we have three comma two, those are referring to the, the representations of the strong and the weak force. And finally, I have this subscript that is denoted as the, the, the weak hypercharge. So all of these different fermions in the standard model have different kind of strange weak hypercharge values that you need to get from the grand unified theory. So it's not just enough to just use any theory that gives you SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. In order to get the standard model, you need to have a model that gets all of these representations with the correct charges as well. And that's an additional constraint. So we also have the, the, the right-handed up quark, the right-handed down quark, which are weak isospin singlets, but still quarks. And then there's also this leptonic doublet that combines the, the electron and the neutrino into a weak isospin doublet. And finally, there's also a right-handed electron. And for this talk, I'm actually going to include a right-handed neutrino, which is quite natural uh, from the perspective of E8 and the mathematics we're considering. And so you'll notice I have this covariant derivative D that's in the action. And these actually what encode the interactions with the gauge bosons in the standard model. So in general, you might have some charge. You might have some coefficient that you put here for the, the, the weak hypercharge. And that would describe how much the, the fermion couples with this B field. And those are encoded in the charges here. And if it's a weak isospin doublet, then you'll also add these W bosons. And finally, if it's a, it's a color triplet, you would also add these gluons. So you can imagine psi being very applicable for this uh, these, uh, left chiral quark doublet right there, because it would have all three of these interaction terms. Whereas some of the others, even the, the right-handed neutrino, it doesn't interact with anything. It's a singlet of both interactions, but it also has zero charge. So you just get the, the covariant derivative for this one. You see, I didn't even write a covariant derivative, because there's no interactions in the standard model there. So moving on, there's also this Higgs and Yukawa sector that breaks the symmetry. So Here's the, the Lagrangian for the, the Higgs sector. It's got this uh, kinetic term with the covariant derivative acting on the Higgs field because it's actually a Higgs doublet and it has uh, some, uh, some weak hypercharge. And we also add this mass term as well as this quartic term to get this uh, Mexican hat potential that allows us to break the symmetry and get the desirable properties. So we have a Higgs VEV. And that Higgs vacuum expectation value allows us to write down these Yukawa terms and when you write down these terms, basically what ends up happening is since the standard model is left chiral, you don't have the ability to write in a mass term because a mass term for fermions typically requires the left chiral and right chiral fermions. And so we couldn't get an electroweak sector with uh, the typical mass mechanism. So we had to introduce these Yukawa couplings as the simplest way to just simply get masses for the fermions. And so when we do this at the, the Lagrangian level, it's not technically a mass term. It's actually this uh, cubic term. We have three fields here. We have two fermions and a Higgs field in between. But when we take a vacuum expectation value, it effectively acts as a mass, such that we only effectively have two, um, two fermions interacting in this term. And we know that mass terms are associated with uh, quadratic terms. And so this is how we can give mass to the, the, the fermions with the, the Higgs mechanism. So the next thing we're going to be interesting that we've reviewed the standard model is how can we unify the standard model? And there's a lot of different common ways that have been studied over the years. And this goes back to the 1970s, really. So one way to do it is to use this uh, petit salam grand, grand unified theory. It, doesn't, it sort of unifies the, the gauge bosons a little bit, but not too much, actually. It actually combines the quarks, quarks and leptons into a, a four-component object instead of a three-component object. And that's why you get SU4. And so you, you get spin 6 cross spin 4, which is actually the same thing as SU4 cross SU2 cross SU2. So you can describe it either way. And the next most common gut is SU5. And it's also worth pointing out that both SU5 gut and Petit Salam fit inside of spin 10. And also there's, so spin 10 is very nice for that reason, because it's, it's, it's kind of agnostic. If, if you're not sure if you want to do SU5 or Petit Salam, it's helpful to at least study the mathematics 
of spin 10 gut to, to understand um, how to go either way. And also spin 10 can fit inside of E6, so it's natural to get spin 10 gut if you were starting with E6 gut. And I'll also point out that there's this flipped SU5 gut. And what this does is if you look at spin 10 there, and you look at the, the maximal subalgebra, you actually get SU5 cross U1. So one way to just use the, the standard SU5 spectrum is to just kind of ignore that U1 and focus on this SU5. But there's also this other model that came out in 1982 by Stephen Barr that proposed that we, we can get a different spectrum by flipping the, the standard Georgie Glashow SU5 gut spectrum to this flipped SU5 gut model. And it fits maximally inside of spin 10 very nicely. And I'll also point out there's also that motivated this notion of flipped spin 10 gut because you can actually find spin 10 cross U1 inside of E6. And I'll also briefly mention that you can find um, SU3 cross SU3 cross SU3 inside of E6. So that's sometimes called trinification. Finally, E8 has E6 cross SU3. And this SU3 has been studied for three generations. And this actually gets used in string theory as well. So um, it's worth pointing that out. And so just to review, basically, if we have E8, we can get to E6, and we'll get an extra SU3 if we want. And we can also have E6 descend to spin 10. And we can get SU5. We can get Petit Salam. And I should mention E6 can also lead to that trinification model. And there's a few others that you could explore. But these, these are kind of the most popular, definitely starting at spin 10 and going to the SU5 and Petit Salam down to the standard model right here. Those are the most common grand unified theories. So now that we have reviewed the grand unified theories, we're interested in understanding if E8 can be used uh, for unification physics. And we want to try to understand the questions basically we're going to be interested in answering in this talk is how can we get general relativity, the dynamics of general relativity, the standard model, to fit into a single 248-dimensional uh, representation of E8. And specifically, one of the challenges with this is trying to understand how three generations fit inside the 128 spinner of E8. Because Typically, the standard model has 64 off-shell degrees of freedom for one generation, implying that there should be 192 for three generations. And you can find 192 degrees of freedom inside of E8, but you're only going to get 128 fermions. So basically, it's been a, it's been a, a, a struggle to understand how to, if, if this 128 spinner can solely be used for three generations. And another thing we'll be interested in is how can complex fermions how can we get chiral fermions in D equals 3 plus 1 with complex representations to come out of this real Majorana vial spinner, uh, the 128, in D equals 12 plus 4? And so that's been another issue with, uh, say, Garrett Lisi's work, is that it was claimed that since you have these real representations, you won't be able to get the complex spinners that we know and love. And hint that 128 spinner has octo octonionic structure. And so you can look at it as 128 real degrees of freedom, or you can look at it as the octo-octonions, which is uh, the tensor product. So 8 times 8 is 64. And if you square that, you have a two-vector of these octo-octonions. Uh, just a hint, there's, there's plenty of complex structure in the, the octo-octonions. So basically, a couple other questions we're going to be interested in. What are the class of valid gravigut models where we combine grand unified theories with gravity from E8? And OK, we can classify all the possibilities, but it would also be nice just to have one specific realization of a single model. So this talk will attempt to do both of those things. So the, the two papers that I'm mainly going to be referring to uh, involves this, uh, this paper that I collaborated with Mike Rios and Alessio Morani, which was titled Beyond the Standard Model with Six Dimensional Spinners. But really, we should have called it Six Dimensional Twisters. And Penrose called these things pseudo-twisters. Uh, about a year or two ago, so it's quite curious. And also, there's uh, work that's going to appear shortly, also with Clee Irwin, that will discuss minimal field theory from an exceptional superconformal uh, multiplet. And in both of these titles, you can kind of tell I tried to hide the fact that we're talking about E8. <laughs> so to briefly discuss some of the representation theory and why we might be interested in this, uh, essentially, conservation laws motivate continuous symmetries, and those continuous symmetries end up motivating representations of Lie algebras, because Lie algebras describe the transformation, transformations that generate these continuous symmetries. So you have some Lie algebra, and it, you can have different representations. Um, so if you could have a, a semi-simple Lie algebra that combines a, a direct sum of, let's say, you had g1 up to gn, right? then you're going to have representations. You already saw this to some degree, where you could have r1 
dot, 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 all the way up to Rn, where each of those are corresponding to representations of each of those simple Lie groups. And also, we can get charges that I mentioned, which will be subscripts. And so you can have u1 charges. And you can also have spin 1, 1 charges, because u1 is actually spin 2. So spin 1, 1 is a non-compact version of u1. Or you could also relate it to the split complex numbers. So I'm going to always denote uh, charges with subscripts for u1 or spin 1, 1. And so it's also pointing out that there's this notion of defining representations, which is a mathematical term because we we know that a lot of these uh, Lie algebras can be found from matrix representations over division algebras. And so that's where a lot of these Lie algebras get their name, like special unitary SU2 are the special unitary 2 by 2 complex matrices. And that's a specific defining representation of SU2, but SU2 is actually more abstract. But still, we want to understand explicit representations for physics. And it's worth just briefly cataloging how we can get a lot of these things with the real complex quaternionic and octonionic uh, values. And there's a lot of low dimensional ex exceptional isomorphisms that relate these to the, um, the, the special orthogonal groups. Uh, so I'm not even going to go through this table exhaustively, but I just figured it's worth showing. And obviously, E8, all right, so it's worth mentioning that you can consider, um, once you go into the division algebras, instead of uh, special unitary, it's actually better to consider anti unitary transformations. And when you do that, that's what I mean by SA3, for instance. So that'll be three by three matrices over some algebra A. And we could have special anti-unitary uh, transformations. And specifically, you can formulate E8 as being SA3 of O cross O. So three by three anti-unitary matrices over the octo-octonians. And I put this arrow over it because since we get non-associative structure, we actually have to consider nested operations. So typically, with the complex um, groups, we just act once, and that's it. But with octonians, since they're associative, you can get non-associative. You can get more actions by multiplying once, twice, or three times. And that, those are actually important for uncovering all the algebraic structure, which obviously adds some non-triviality that you only get with the octonians, which is part of the reason why it's been so challenging. So once we establish some of this representation theory, we're, we're going to be interested in spontaneous symmetry breaking from some Lie algebra to some Lie subalgebra. And when we do that, um, basically, we're going to have some Lie algebra G and some subalgebra H. And we're going to want to consider branching rules. And what the branching rules tell you is how representations of the algebra lead to representations of the subalgebra. So one simple example of this could be how G2 could break to SU3. And the adjoint representation of G2 is 14 dimensional. So we want to understand how the 14 dimensions of G2 in the adjoint representation leads to representations of SU3. And the cool thing about this is it leads to the adjoint. It always has to get the adjoint from the adjoint. So we get this eight representation because there's eight gluons. But it's really cute how you also get this fundamental and anti-fundamental representation of SU3, which is actually what's used for, for quarks and anti-quarks. So in some sense, it, it almost looks like G2 is this toy model of an, a mathematics that sort of shows you how to combine bosons and fermions, but obviously it doesn't get a lot of the structure, such as the spin, uh, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's definitely curious. This is just a curious example, but that's just uh, one example. So I'm just going to give a lightning review of different uh, real forms of these exceptional Lie algebras and some of their um, ortho special orthogonal maximal subalgebras. So there's F4 minus 52, which is the compact real form, and that has SO9, so nine-dimensional rotations with this extra 16 spinner. And there's also F4 minus 20, and that can uh, land on SO81. And I'm not even exhaustively showing all of the maximal subalgebras, but these are just um, key ones that I'm highlighting. There's also this F44, which has uh, SO54, and all of them include this 16 spinner as well, uh, associated with those special orthogonal groups. And here are the commentators for this F4 algebra. And so we can move on to E6, and there's actually five different real forms. So one of them has SO10. Another one has SO91, another has SO82, another SO64, another SO55. So it's really curious how you can get all of these different types of uh, Lie algebras from the complex form of E6 to get different real forms of E6. And I'll just briefly mention that you can see how this quotient space, so if you take, if you take these generators, generators in E6 and you mod out by, let's say you go to the, the compact real form and you mod out by spin 10 cross U1,
The, the only thing, oh, there's a typo there. So that there should only be one 16 there. So when you mod out by this spin 10 cross U1, you're going to get the 16 plus 16 bar spinner representations. So we see how this quotient space isolates these spinner representations, which corresponds exactly to those uh, Rosenfeld projective planes. And so once again, if we move on to E7, we get a few different options now. There's four different real forms. One of them has SO12 with SU2, another uh, SO10, 2, another has SO8, 4, and another has SO6, 6. So finally, we're going to move on to E8, and there's only three real forms. And you can think of this because you can have the octonians with the octonians, you can have the octonians with the split octonians, or you can have the split octonians with the split octonians. So if you use the, the compact real form, you're going to use octonians with octonians, and you'll get SO16 rotations in 16 dimensions, and you'll get this 128 spinner. And the star of this talk will be E8 minus 24. I'm going to focus on this one primarily, and that has SO12-4. And finally, there's this E8, E8, E8 8 that has a SO8, 8. And all of them, once again, have this uh, 128 spinner with respect to the special orthogonal group. And so this isn't an exhaustive classification, but um, we have exhaustively classified all these, and we just isolated all of the, the potentially physically relevant maximal subalgebras inside this E8 minus 24. Um, basically, you can get SO12-4. That's, that's one way to go. There's also this XO16 star. Um, I'll move on from that. There's also SU72. This one's pretty interesting. I would say it's even more interesting than SU63, but maybe there's some utility there. The big star for this talk is going to be this SU32 plus SU5, but you can also get SU32 plus SU4, 1, and there's also various other exceptional um, maximal subalgebras that contain exceptional Lie algebras that you can get as well in terms of E7, E6, and F4 with G2. So that's just some fun math, but now let's try to dive into the physics. So just to give uh, a historical overview of how E8 has been used in physics, really the first theory probably was from Bars and Gunaydin that introduced this E8 gut, and it also used this 3,875 Higgs representation, which is very large, so it's a little unwieldy. Um, around the same time, um, I forget, the, there was actually two authors, Konstein was one of them, and they, they considered this supersymmetric E8 gut model and it used a 248 dimensional Higgs and also added supersymmetry. So that's a curious model. So I, I believe it used two different 248 representations and then also applied supersymmetry. So in some sense, it was like it used four 248 representations, if I understand properly. And Olive and West also discussed this N equals four supersymmetric E8 gauge theory. And U duality has been studied in supergravity, which relates to various exceptional Lie groups, including E8 in some cases. And finally, by the 1980s, uh, E8 cross E8 heterotic string theory was introduced, which is one of the most popular ways to use E8 to connect to the standard model, but it, it has a lot of extra structure as well. And um, I should mention that Barr also discussed aspects of three generations for E8, and even M theory was written about as being an E8 gauge theory, which is pretty curious to think about. And finally, uh, well, West also describes how E11 might really be for M theory, which contains E8. And there's also some mathematical physics that has been discussed by various people in the string theory and supergravity community relating to E8, non-compact real forms of E8. And also, it's worth pointing out that uh, Stephen Adler wrote about hopes for three generations from E8, as well as uh, claiming that it might be inspirational for superalgebra, for supersymmetry. And so another crucial point along the, the historical timeline was when uh, Garrett Lisi put out this work in 2007. And it was a little contentious because he put this paper on the archive and he never got it published. And it was very, it had a nice title. It had a lot of inspirational ideas, but uh, there was a lot of pieces that were missing. It, it didn't identify chiral fermions. It didn't explain why three generations were found. It was strange because it mentioned spin 15 comma one, which isn't even in E8. I mean, you could claim it's a wick rotation, but he didn't even mention that. And also, he claimed to have a super connection, but in order to have a super connection, you need a super algebra, and E8 is not a super algebra. So there was a lot of issues there. And for this talk, we were actually more inspired by his 2015 work, which looked at this E8 minus 24. And he talked in that a lot about this spin 4 comma 4 across spin 8, which relates to the, spin the split octonians and the octonians. And but there was no rigorous derivation of the gauge theory from this because it doesn't really exactly work. Um, and he didn't really explicitly describe how to get three generations there either. 
So we're going to try to figure out how to make sense of this. So just to formalize a, a, a solid research question, we're going to say that Lisi's dream is to get the stair model with gravity from a single 248 representation of E8. And so there's kind of two incarnations of this dream. One is a very strict way is to say, I only want a theory with 248 off-shell degrees of freedom. And that's actually pretty hard to pull off. But another, a looser way you could say is, I just want to construct a theory that only uses uh, a single 248 representation to describe all the fields. And I'll, so this one's a little easier, because what we can actually do is study a subalgebra of E8, and then as associate that subalgebra with some spin one gauge bosons, and then treat all the other representations as scalar matter, as is typically done in gauge gravity. And that allows us to find utility from E8. So once again, we're going to gauge a subalgebra, or you could even gauge a sub subalgebra and study that. And so to motivate which real form of E8 we might want, basically, gravity is non-compact because we have this Lorentz group with three space and one time. But the, the grand unified theories are typically all compact. So basically, this E8 minus 24, is, it's slightly non-compact. It has enough room for gravity, but it's mostly compact in some sense. Um, in terms of SO 12.4, it's got, instead of having um, SO 8 comma 8, um, it's a little bit better for that. So basically we can get, it's, it's the most natural one to pick if you want to get the non-compact notions of gravity with some compact notions of grand unified theory, which typically use large, larger algebras. So at one point I thought that E8 minus 20 was the only viable route, but I should mention that I think there's actually um, oh, this is a typo, but basically E88 has SU32 cross SU32. So you actually can get two SU32s. And it's pretty curious because the non-compact generators in this SU32 gut would correspond precise, precisely to the X and Y bosons that lead to proton decay. So that's kind of an issue with SU5 gut. So maybe in future work, we could explore this E88 and see if it leads to different uh, properties for proton decay. And actually, that's in uh, Eric Weinstein's model as well, which is pretty curious. There's one route to go in his way of looking at things. So basically, if we focus on this E8 minus 24, we're going to be interested in what are all the possible chains that lead to the Lorentz group with the standard model and also get all the correct charges, which is very important. And basically, um, there's a few different ways to do it. But you can't use E6 to do this because you're not going to get the Lorentz group outside of E6. E6. So, um, we can't get this trinification either, really. And, but it turns out you can get spin 10, you can get flipped SU5 gut or SU5 gut, and you can get petit salon. Well, actually, we found that if you focus on just the 248 representation, uh, you won't have a Higgs for spin 10, and you can't get SU5 gut either, but you can get flipped SU5 gut. So that's actually the model we'll be focusing on. And, but it's also just worth pointing out mathematically, if you did introduce extra fields, you could study a bunch of different grand unified theories uh, with gravity. So basically, one path to go is to go to this SO12.4, and then you could just immediately break off a conformal group, and that would isolate SO10. But it makes it a little hard to motivate three generations from that perspective. But it's worth pointing out that people have considered this in the literature, but I don't think anyone has really nailed how to get gravity and the standard model with spin 10 gut inside of E8 with three generations. Because once you isolate a conformal group, as we'll see, it's very difficult to see the motivation for three generations. But there's other ways to go, too. You can actually go to this SU72 or this SU32 plus SU5. And what is remarkable is both of these paths lead to the same sub-subalgebra of E8, which is this SU22 plus U1 plus SU5. And so this U1 plus SU5 is for flipped gut, and this SU22 is for the conformal sector. And I was trying to do an exhaustive classification. Maybe I missed one example, but hey, you get the right idea. And so it's also remarkable how this um, you can actually get uh, other ways to go to Petit Salam um, that avoid going through spin 10 as well. So that's just kind of cute. And um, there's also ways to get this left-right symmetric model that don't go through Petit Salam. So there's a lot of new math that we can find has applications to physics, and none of this has really been explored before. So Hopefully, this is showing us how to explore a new class of models. And the most interesting point is that this SU5 with the conformal group in the U1, it can be found from three different paths. You can go through the SO4, 12. You can go to the SU5 plus SU23, or you can go to the SU27. 
So it's really curious to us how you can get all three of these and they lead to the same result. So rather than studying, picking one, or th one of these three, maybe we should just focus on making a model off of this just to see what happens. And that's kind of what we'll be doing. And there's another important ingredient to what we'll be doing for this model. And, and the insight comes from Piero Cherini. And so what he did was he actually, he had this model where he was looking at a 12 dimensional lattice and he took E8 as a eight dimensional lattice and he added this discrete space-time lattice outside of E8. And he was interested in applying a sociohedra to this. And he introduced this Grassmann envelope of the compact real form of E8. And it, while his model didn't completely describe everything, there's this really important mathematical insight that I, I think is very important, which is this Grassmann envelope, because it allows us to turn E8 into a super Lie algebra. And that allows us to get uh, well, in this talk, we're not even going to present a model with a superconnection, but you could use this superalgebra to use a superconnection if you wanted, as Garrett Lisi wanted. And also, Adler was interested in supersymmetry for three generations. So this is how you can actually turn E8 into a superalgebra. And it's really hilarious just because uh, Bars and Gunaiden back in the day, they discussed how you could turn, let's see, they, they discussed how to turn superalgebras into Lie algebras. And they also discussed E8 in that paper to extensive detail, but they never thought to do it backwards. And so Shestikov also pointed out how, how to um, do this Grassmann envelope, but it was really Piero Cherini who understood that if we want to turn E8 into a super Lie algebra, then we should do it. We can actually apply the same mathematical trick and it kind of goes both ways. And this is motivated because we know that supersymmetry was introduced to describe how to unify fermions with the other gauge groups, uh, so to speak, so to get around Coleman Mandula. So if we see that these spinner representations are in E8, it's actually quite curious to see that we can turn E8 into a super Lie algebra. And so the way to do this is to isolate a Z2 grading via the bosonic sector spin 12 comma 4. And so if you write down the commutator algebra of E8 in terms of a manifest spin 12 4 basis, you'll get two generators associated with these representations. So you'll get some 16 dimensional rotations and you'll get this spinner uh, representation associated with this generator I'll call T alpha. And so these are the commutation relations, whereas uh, super algebras have super commutation relations where the spinner representations, when you take two spinners in a super commutator, it's actually an anti-commutator and not a commutator. So the fact that this is a commutator is why it's not a super Lie algebra. But when we apply the, the Grassmann envelope, it, it turns this into an anti-commutator and it becomes a super Lie algebra. And moreover, it's actually the n equals 1 super conformal algebra and d equals 11 plus 3. This is really curious because there's been work that have talked about classifications of super conformal algebras and even up to very high dimensions beyond. But none of the string theorists understood any algebraic way to describe this n equals 1 super conformal algebra in d equals 11 plus 3. But this is really interesting because it was also noted in 19, uh, 1997 that the superalgebra that unifies all of the superalgebras in supergravity and string theory is actually in d equals 11 plus 3. But nobody followed up on that. So we're actually turning E8 into the superalgebra and getting something that seems to have applications to basically all of string theory. But we're not even going to get into that in this talk. And so you can actually embed this uh, Grassmann envelope of E8 into three different uh, minimal classical least super algebras, which is also curious, but it's a little technical. And so now when we're focusing on this SU32 cross SU5, it helps us figure out how to get to some interesting physics because this SU32 has three different conformal groups. And so that's going to be a big part of the story. But we're going to want to just follow through with the representation theory and the branching rules when we go from E8 to SU32 cross SU5. And then we're going to break that SU32 into SU22 cross U1 and keep SU5 along for the ride. And so you're going to get all of these different representations that come out. And I'll, it might be a lot to take in right now. So I'll, we'll probably come back to this and get some of the field content in a bit. So one of the first questions we had to figure out is when we look at this SU32 inside of E8, how does it work inside of this Grassmann envelope? And we noticed that when you break SU32 into SU22 cross U1, you actually get this 4 and 4 bar, which are spinner representations. So these 4 and 4 bar representations are in the 128 spinner inside of E8, which means they're actually 
you can actually take the Grassmann envelope of this SU32 and get the n equals 1 superconformal algebra or superconformal group, SU22 bar 1. Uh, and so this is really curious. We're seeing that E8 is naturally showing us how to get the superconformal group uh, in D equals 3 plus 1, which as we know is relevant for space time, inside of E8, naturally from this uh, maximal subalgebra of E8. And so this is the conformal algebra. It has 15 generators. You have the Lorentz boosts and rotations with J. You have the, the, the translations with P. You have these uh, special conformal transformations K. And finally, these uh, scale transformations or dilations D. And those add up to 15 dimensions. This is the commutator algebra. And you can also get this n equals 1 super conformal algebra, which uh, has these generators Q and S, which refer to those two 4 and 4 bar spinners that I was talking about. And um, you know, if you're really interested in this, you can study this. And so there's this generator A that was found back here that is, corresponds to the U1. And what, I, what I'm pointing out here is basically this SU32 has three different conformal charts inside of it. And it's naturally motivated to lead to three different matrix representations where this, you could have A1, A2, and A3. And they're almost identical. It's just um, basically there's this SU2 part here and then this SU3 part inside of SU32. And when we break to SU22 cross U1, we can decide where we want that SU2 to be. Should we have the SU2 be here, split between there, or down here? And so that, that motivates these uh, three charts, which we'll uh, be using for three generations. And the other curious thing about this is that the standard model uses left chiral spinners. So you might initially be worried that maybe we can't use this. It's kind of bizarre to uh, use three different subalgebras. But another encouraging fact is that if we were to introduce uh, projection operators to focus on left chiral spinners, it doesn't matter anyway because uh, all three of these components would get projected out. So in some sense, the, I mean, the point is basically whether you go here, here, or here, the SU2 associated um, with the upper part is the same in all three, and that um, might motivate why we can get utility. That's, there's actually multiple motivations for how to get three generations, but that's just one of them. And so the other curious thing is when we isolate these representations in terms of the Grassmann envelope of SU32 with SU5, you actually get these uh, motivations for uh, candidate superfields. Now, the SU5 part doesn't participate in the, the, the supersymmetry. So if we mod out by SU5, all of the other representations have a mix of bosons and fermions. And so we can focus on, how, and there's actually three different types. So if you look at the SU5 or flipped SU5 gut spectrum, you'll get this one representation as a singlet. That's typically the right-handed neutrino in SU5 gut, but in the flipped gut model, it becomes the right-handed electron. So we need that one singlet, which is found in E8 for flip gut. And you get this 5 bar and this 10 representation. And we actually see that those representations are found in these representations of SU32 cross SU5. But if you explore further, you'll see that you can take the, the even and odd part and identify all of the, um, you get the fermions and the bosons separated. And so we naturally see that E8, when you take the Grassmann envelope, is somehow suggesting a pair, pairing between uh, the bosons and the fermions, which is pretty curious because we're getting these super multiplets, but we're not introducing any super partners. So typically, it, it's, it's stated that the minimally supersymmetric standard model, it sounds like it's the minimal model, has these additional unobserved selectrons and squarks and all these super partners that we don't find at the LHC. But here it is. It's a super algebra. And we only get the standard model fermions, and we don't get additional unobserved fermions or other um, exotic particles like we do with other string theory or supersymmetry models. So that's why this is so interesting. And so that, that talked a little bit more about the representation theory and grand unified theory. And it's also worth pointing out that we, we want to get general relativity at low energies, but um, general relativity is not a gauge theory. But gauge theories are known to be nice for quantum field theory. So if we want unification, it really does motivate the study of gauge theories. And certainly, string theory and loop quantum gravity consider gauge theories, such as Einstein-Cartan theory, which gauges the Lorentz group. And this theory is more or less equivalent to general relativity, especially outside of matter. So the vacuum equations are absolutely identical, and there's no propagating torsion there. Uh, but there's other theories that you could gauge as well. And I'll just mention that the conformal gauge gravity is, is quite nice. And so it's common to study Yang-Mills theory, which has quadratic Lagrangians,
And so unification does motivate a study of quadratic gauge gravity, but the Einstein-Hilbert action is linear, not quadratic, quadratic in the curvature. But there's a lot of history here. So basically, we're going to be synthesizing some results from Yang of Yang-Mills theory. He actually published this theory of gravity in 1974. There's also this MacDowell man story, gravity and supergravity. He studied both in 1976. And Garrett Lisi was interested in that. So we're going to be using that. We're also going to be studying the superconformal, the conformal and the superconformal gravity introduced by Kaku and friends in 1977. And so basically, that's going to motivate um, these types of gauge groups. You could gauge the Lorentz group or the de Sitter, anti Sitter. But we're going to go to the conformal group, SU22, as you might have saw. So um, just to kind of briefly review, it's also worth pointing out that the notion of Lorentz gauge gravity as Yang-Mills theory has this uh, hidden history where Carmelli studied, but most people have overlooked that work. Uh, but once Yang put out his paper, everyone paid attention. And it was, it was a little strange because it had solutions to Einstein's field equations, but it also had these other solutions from box equations, which at the time were thought to be problematic. Now, there's a couple people who claim that maybe it has good cosmology. But um, it gauged GL4R, which is the general linear group, uh, which can be used for linear diffeomorphisms. Um, but this theory overlooked how GL4R would actually, uh, if you gauge that, you're going to get non-matricity. So that was overlooked. It's just a curious comment. Um, but then there's also this Gauss-Bonnet term that's going to be important for uh, macdowell mansori gravity, which almost is, it looks identical to Yang-Mills, but it's actually a little different. It's quadratic, though. And so when you write it in differential forms, you can write it like that. And by the time you expand it to the tensors, you can write it this way. And in four dimensions, it turns out to be this topological term. So you can add it to uh, Einstein's uh, Lagrange. You can add it to the Einstein-Hilbert action, and it's not going to change the equations of motion. So this is studied a lot because it has some curious properties. But basically, this alone doesn't really change much classically. And so what the, the insight of MacDowell and Mansouri was pretty brilliant because they they considered this Gauss-Bonnet term, and they gauged a higher gauge group, but then they only considered the spin 3-1 part. Now, you might need to study this on your own to really understand it, but the basic idea is they considered a spin connection, which is, which is a type of connection that has a vector index, and then two other local vector indices for the gauge symmetry. And so we're considering rotations. And so you can think of these two uh, gauge, those gauge indices, the A and B, as kind of helping with describing those rotations. And so if you lift the gauge symmetry to a higher gauge symmetry, such as spin 4, 1, this lowercase a and b that ran from 0, 1, 2, and 3 now has a fifth dimension. So we can fit the older spin connection and put the frame field in there as well. And then it turns out that the field strength for this lifted um, spin connection has the curvature and torsion. Now, if we don't want to focus on propagating torsion, we can lift the gauge field and just focus on this Lorentzian piece. And what's kind of remarkable is you might at first glance think that, hey, I'm just taking the Lorentzian subcomponent, so it should be the same thing. But no, you actually get this uh, script R here, this, this uh, field strength that's a curvature. It's a lifted curvature. When you focus on the Lorentzian part, you get the typical curvature term that you would get. But you also get these contributions from the frame field. And that's because you have these contracted indices with the, when you calculate the curvature, there's this quadratic term in the spin connection. So when you sum over these indices, you're going to get aspects from that extra dimension. And it's going to bring some of these frame fields down into this lifted curvature term. And the cool thing is, is when you plug that into the Gauss-Bonnet action, you keep the same form, but use this lifted spin 3, 1 curvature instead of the typical one, you, you magically get um, basically um, GR. But it's, it's also kind of curious because there's an error in the 1976 paper that wasn't really figured out to 2006. And it's really hilarious just because it's kind of obvious and everyone overlooked it. But um, what, what is really curious is basically when you, when you take this macdowell mansori theory, you end up getting the Gauss-Bonnet term, but you get the Einstein-Hilbert action with this extra term. And that extra term is a constant and can be used for um, a cosmological constant. So this macdowell mansori gravity gives you Gauss-Bonnet, which doesn't really change much and might be good for some uh, quantum gravity, and you get Einstein-Hilbert with a cosmological constant. So it's pretty remarkable. And I'm not sure if anyone even pointed this out, but specifically when you use spin 4, 1 or spin 3, 2, and you use the Yang-Mills action, which includes this Hodge dual instead, you get exactly the same thing, more or less, except uh, you get this Yang-Mills term here. This isn't topological, 
So um, this will destroy the physics classically, but it's, it's really curious how um, you can actually get the Einstein-Hilbert action from this Yang-Mills term. And it's been really confusing in the literature because there are papers that will say Yang-Mills gauge gravity and then use this one. It, it's, it's been pretty confusing. So um, what actually happened when you go to this conformal gauge gravity though is you lift higher and you go to spin 4, 2 instead of uh, 4, 1 or 3, 2. And that changes things because you get this F mu A, which is the gauge field of those special conformal transformations. And so now that enters this lifted gauge field. But fortunately, what you can do is basically solve for it and then plug it in. You can basically get rid of it and see what you get. So you get a different theory when you lift it. And so the, the super conformal uh, gravity theory first considered the, they first considered the conformal group with the mcdowell mansouri action but then they considered the conformal group instead of uh, um, like an anti-de-sitter or de-sitter group. And so they get something different. They didn't get Einstein-Hilbert anymore, but they still published the paper and said, hey, this is really inspirational. So it, it's kind of this weird thing because they, they're, they're claiming it's nice for physics, but they weren't actually able to get Einstein's field equations from it. And so one of the things that I did was I said, well, let's just compute it for the mcdowell mansouri and the Yang-Mills. And now we get something slightly different. They, they, for the, the previous case, for what MacDowell and Mansouri considered, it didn't matter too much if you used Yang-Mills or this gauss bonnet term. But now we see that the coefficients are slightly different. We get a third on one and a sixth on the other. And so basically, my point is that if you do some tricks, you can combine both of these. And it makes sense. Typically, in theories, all the terms you can write down, you want to write them down and consider it. So it, first of all, even motivating why you choose one and not the other is kind of strange. But basically, I realized if you take both of the terms and plug it in, and you take another result, you can actually get Einstein-Hilbert to come out of uh, quadratic conformal gauge gravity. And so basically, um, you have to kind of do a little bit of a trick where you identify this additional scalar degree of freedom. And you can basically do this replacement where you get this other action. And so if you isolate this scalar degree of freedom, in this conformal gauge gravity, and you claim that it have a vacuum expectation value, then you can actually get Einstein-Hilbert. Now, and I say this is a little bit of a trick because I'm not really spontaneous symmetry breaking, but um, that's that's worth studying in future work. And there's a precedent for this. Typically, uh, it's very hard to study spontaneous symmetry breaking at gravity. So if you want to get started, you fit, it's there's a precedent for first just kind of putting out the theory and then having future work study the spontaneous symmetry breaking. So that's what I'm doing here. But if we assume that there would be some VEV that could come out of the scalar degree of freedom, then we can get Einstein-Hilbert with a cosmological constant. And so it's, it's pretty curious. And so there it is. So we can get Einstein field equations. So that, that kind of concludes the gravitational sector. And basically, we're going to have to start flying through these slides. But we can get standard versus flipped SU5 gut. And basically, as I was saying, we're going to focus on this uh, flipped gut, which to get the weak hypercharge, it mixes um, two different U1 symmetries. So we have SU5 cross U1. But when we break the SU5, there's going to be another U1 here. And then in the typical um, SU5 gut, they just take this U1z and associate it with the weak hypercharge. So what Stephen Barr did is he realized that you can actually mix this XU1 and this ZU1, where the XU1 is inside of spin 10, but not inside SU5. And you can actually get it to work out where you get a slightly different spectrum, and you get a flipped gut model instead. And so that's what we're going to be using. And so this is just kind of reviewing um, the, the generators of SU5 cross U1. But you know, I'll, I'll just show these on the screen. You guys can study this on your own if you're interested. But you can have the Gelman matrices and the poly matrices and a U1 generator and find how those fit in SU5. And then we get this fermionic spectrum where we get this one representation with the right-handed electron. We have this five bar that has the right-handed um, up quark. And then it's also got the, uh, the leptonic as, um, SU2 doublet, so it's going to have the, the neutrino and the electron. And then there's also this 10 representation, which has all the other fields. It has a, a quark doublet. It has the right-handed neutrino, as well as the uh, right-handed down quark. And so um, these fancy indices that I have here with the, the circle over are going to run from 1 to 5 for the fundamental representation for SU5. And so this one, it's a singlet, so it has zero indices. The 5 bar has a lowered index, and the 10 representation is actually an anti-symmetric two form in this uh, color space, let's say, or this uh, gut, gut internal chart space. And so if you anti-symmetrize two indices, you'll get 10 unique degrees of freedom, which is why it's called a 10 representation.
And you see here that this matrix is anti-symmetric and has zero diagonal, isolating those 10 degrees of freedom. And so I have this nice scheme for labeling all my indices, but don't worry about it too much. And so what we did is basically we take this group theory, we, we follow the branching rules, we isolate all the representations, and we have to focus on the Lorentz group to isolate if it's, uh, if it's spin 1, spin 0, if it's uh, spin 1 half. And we have all these representations, and then we associate fields with them. Um, so that can be done. And so just to kind of summarize, we get these gauge bosons for gravity. You can get a frame field. There's this U1 gauge boson, and then there's the SU5 gauge boson. There's 24 of those, and then one of these. Uh, so you can consider these. And then we can also get this fermionic spectrum uh, that has these, uh, the 10, 5 bar, and 1 representation. And we also get these, this new Higgs sector. And so it's pretty curious because um, you need this little Higgs with the 5 bar to get the, the, the electroweak Higgs. That's going to be in here. But you need another Higgs to break the SU5 symmetry. And the flip gut model is really nice because it has a 10 Higgs that can break the symmetry, whereas the standard SU5 gut model cannot use that 10 Higgs, and it has to use something larger. So if we want to get Lisi's dream and we want to get everything from the 248, this is why we had to use the flip gut, because we only had this 10 Higgs to break the symmetry, and it only can work for flipped gut. So the other curious thing is that we get one new candidate. Besides, besides gravity with three generations of the standard model, this model only predicts one type of new field, which is a curious type of Higgs field that is also a vector. So uh, you can actually have uh, vector Higgs fields. And so this model is predicting that there's just one new vector Higgs model. There's no like uh, doubling of the spectrum with super partners. So it's a little curious. And, We'll see over time. I mean, maybe this theory isn't worthwhile, but I mean, it's, it's pretty curious how minimal it actually is. And so you can write down the total action, which would have the, the gauge sector and the matter sector, and you could break it down into kinetic terms and potential terms. And so I, I did briefly mention um, what we did to get the gravitational sector, but basically we lift the gauge field, we subtract away the unlifted one to get rid of um, the Gauss-Binet term and also the Yang-Mills term. It was just a prescription we did. And so when you combine these two terms, there you can solve for what beta should be in terms of alpha. So you can get um, Einstein-Hilbert at low energy. And then we add the Yang-Mills term for the SU5 and the U1. And then, so that describes uh, that sector. And so that, that's kind of the, the, the gauge fields. And so we can write down these uh, the kinetic terms for the matter fields. And so we have three spinner fields in the one, five bar, and 10 representations. And so it's just, um, they're like vial spinners. So it's if you've studied um, the vial equations or Dirac equations, it's just that, and then you add some covariant derivatives. And you know you have to consider them in curved space time, but it's not too tricky. It's in the literature. And then we just have these, uh, these Higgs potentials. So it's just a uh, Klein-Gordon scalar field theory, um, which is a pretty simple theory relatively to <laughs> in comparison to other quantum field theories. And so to focus briefly on this three generation mechanism, what I actually did was I considered Clifford algebras and d equals four plus four. And I constructed a representation of them in terms of these tensor products of uh, CL11. And this was actually helpful for me to understand how to find the right projection operators. Um, and so what's really curious about this is that spin 4, 4 can break into spin 4, 1 cross spin 3, which would be the isometry group of DS4 with S2. And so we have de Sitter space. And we have this additional uh, two-sphere that I'm proposing can be used for mass flavor oscillations. And so um, basically, you can get this spin three of that two-sphere has quaternionic structure that can come from this Clifford algebra. Even though it's a real Clifford algebra, it algebraically is the same as the quaternions. And so we can use this. And it's worth noting that Wilson had a, a paper that was similar to this, but our construction is just slightly different. And um, we were able to construct an action because we can identify these uh, chiral projection operators to give us left chiral fermions uh, for the three generations. And that allows us to write down the action. So when we combine all the projectors right, we project out the mirror fermions that would typically be there. And that allows us to um, write down the action. So you can actually, this is just trying to articulate how you can get complex structure from real vectors, but that's kind of well known. So I'm going to try to get through this, basically. So this is the final action that we get for three generations. The cool thing is that we can write it as three separate terms, but we can actually write it as a single term uh, for all three generations in terms of these uh, 
Well, it's, there's three terms in here because I'm doing a sum. But those three terms act on a single spinner. So um, we can use a 128 spinner and project on the three different generations in a way that you couldn't do without the extra time dimensions. And so that's, that's the trick. That's why no one could get it to work. They typically just try to, they try to just write down three terms separately, and then they would have to write down 192 degrees of freedom. But when we just isolate this spinner and use the right projection operators, we can actually get three different on-shell generations from a single off-shell spinner in a very efficient way. Um, and that's just kind of just summarizing that. Basically, you get the 128 to work instead of the 192 that's typically needed. And so um, you could also write it this way. So now this is including um, all of the um, three generations for all of the spectrum in the, the flipped gut model. Well, actually, for the, the standard model. And so um, basically, you can take covariant derivatives of these fields. You know, this just some technical details. You could write down um, a Higgs potential. It's pretty standard stuff. And voila, this is basically a theory that we can write down that's uh, inspirational to some supersymmetric gut model. So um, that's pretty much it that I have. I think I had a couple more slides, but um, I don't even think it's worth going into those things. I think it's worth just stopping there. So thank you very much for joining me on this, this talk. <laughs>Hi, I'm Clee Irwin, the founder of Quantum Gravity Research. We believe that there is no fundamental separation between spirit and matter. And over these years, we've produced about 100 peer-reviewed papers in mathematics and physics and the interpretations of quantum mechanics, like why it is that a conscious person measuring and observing something physical changes the physical behavior of the system. And we want to keep going because we haven't fully unified spirit and matter in a way that is making predictions of physically realistic behavior. And we've had to do a 40% reduction in our budget because I have run in personally to some temporary financial challenges. And I've never asked for money because I'm not comfortable doing that actually, but I'm asking now. I really need your help. The whole team at Quantum Gravity Research needs your help. We want to keep pushing the mission forward. We want to lean into it and finish the mission. And so we're asking for $1 a month. If you feel moved to help with more, great. But at least $1 a month from enough of our followers will help us get over the hump to keep pushing forward with this mission. So I appreciate you even considering the request, even if you can't do it. And thank you for believing in the power of ideas and consciousness to change the world. Please click the link in the description below to join our giving circle.